Welcome back dear viewer to Mostly Racing, and welcome back to Racing History, and today we're looking at possibly the most bizarre race there has ever been. A race halfway around the world, incidents of fraud, abandonment in the desert, near misses with trains, dicking about in pre-revolutionary Russia, threat of international invasion, and an unorthodox usage of bacon, all play their part in the story of the Peking Paris race of 1907. Don't know about you, but I often find the best way to tell a story is to start at the beginning. So how did this monster race come into being? Well really, it was thanks to that very first Grand Prix in 1906, which you can watch by clicking here, after you've watched this video. More and more, people were becoming racing fans, especially so in the Third French Republic. On the 31st of January, Le Martin, a French newspaper we've encountered before in our travels, led with the headline, Paris Peking Automobile, a stupendous challenge. In short, the article shot down the idea of circuit racing over relatively short distances and championed automotive endurance. After all, isn't that the mass appeal of cars? Instead of pushing your machine for speed until it breaks, you can now go on journeys to places you previously only ever dreamt of. At the end of the article, the question was posed. Is there anyone who will undertake to travel this summer from Paris to Peking by automobile? Thankfully, some people yes. Count Jules de Dion was the first to take up the gauntlet. The fastest man in the first ever major motoring event back in 1894 replied to the challenge stating, It is my belief that if a motor car can get through, the de Dion Bouton will get through. I take up this challenge here and now. Then be fighting words, Count. Next up, it was the Italian nobleman, Prince Scipione Borghese, who ordered a car to compete in the race from the Turin-based Itala company, a company which would later be sold to Fiat in the 1930s. By February, there were roughly 10 teams who supposedly expressed their interest in the race, from the French capital to the Qing capital, and no, don't be confused. This is titled Peking to Paris, yet the earlier headline said Paris to Peking. Well, an eastward odyssey was the plan originally, but the organisers decided to reverse this in order to avoid the rainy season in China, and because a finish in Paris would probably sell more papers. So, the European-based teams, spoilers, all the teams, would have to traverse their way to Peking anyway, and then head back again. As the start dates drew closer, as many as 25 teams were interested in participating, but the vast majority dropped interest due to the challenges in simply reaching the Far East, and due to the quite frankly absurd 2,200 franc entry fee. So we ended up with a jam-packed grid of five entries. Your players for the following are Prince Borghese in his four-cylinder 7.4-litre Itala. My favourite and yours, Charles Goddard, a former jockey, funfair stunt motorcyclist, and all-round swindler who promised fame and fortune to the founder of the Spiker Company and managed to talk himself into one of his cars, with all the additional extras. Tall tyres for clearance, and with what my research describes as a mountain of spares. Truly, Goddard would have been going into the event as the most prepared of all competitors, right? Well, materially, yes. But our former circus performer had no previous experience with navigation, and supposedly didn't even know how compasses worked. Painted on the side of his car were the names Siberia, Russia, Germany, meant to advertise the race as he went along, but the joke at the time was, this was just for him to remember where he was meant to be going. Someone should also point out to him that Siberia is in Russia anyway. In addition to these words, the car was also painted with red, white and blue stripes, a la the Dutch flag. Godard did this, but with vertical stripes, a la the French flag. Perhaps the first red flag to the Dutch mark that Godard was never the most trustworthy person in the room. Georges Cormier and Victor Collion both in two-cylinder de Dion Boutons. And finally, Auguste Pons, in what my source describes as an alarmingly lightweight one-cylinder Contral freewheeler. The alarmingly part deriving from the fact that there was no room for bedding or many rations. It's not like the route was dotted with hotels for them to stay, or garages for repairs. Indeed, it turns out there wasn't much in the way of roads in Mongolia, or the Gobi Desert, or parts of Siberia as yet uncharted. Le Martin actually cancelled the race when they realised how few cars were competing, but word didn't reach the drivers in time, and now the race was inevitable. 
All drivers were joined by a journalist, and the route would follow telegraph poles, so these journalists could send updates back to Paris on the race's progress, which could then be printed in the papers. First hurdle of the race, getting to the start line, some 10,000 miles away. The Italian Borghese crossed Asia on camels, on horses, and even on occasion, on foot. An ordeal, to be sure, but this familiarisation of the landscape would pay dividends later, while Charles Goddard borrowed a reported 60,000 francs and sold off all those spare parts Spiker had supplied him with, just so he could get halfway across the world by ship and have a good time doing so. So the man with no experience of navigation, reportedly didn't understand how compasses worked, now only had one set of tyres to complete the 10,000 mile journey. Oh, and he didn't have any fuel with him when he arrived. So he duped the Dutch again at the Dutch Embassy in Peking, by borrowing another 5,000 francs, under the pretense that Spiker would be paying this back. Needless to say, such an agreement was non-existent, so he had just robbed them blind. Second hurdle of the race the Qing Chinese officials allowing the race to actually go ahead. In the minds of the Chinese government officials, the question was raised, what if the whole purpose of the race is actually so Europeans could scope out routes for invasion? The State Council of the Celestial Chinese Empire wanted these automobiles out as soon as. After all, the cars would cause an upheaval in the popular mind and spread everywhere the fatal germs of Western corruption. It's, it's just a race, fellas, it's not that deep. Anyway, under heavy observation and fear of being detained, at 8am on the 10th of June, the race began. In the gentlemen's agreement, it was decided that the drivers would not race proper until they reach Irkutsk in Russia, instead running as a convoy for the first thousand miles. This thousand mile agreement lasted only a few hundred yards out of Peking, when the dirty on Bouton of Collion and the control of ponds got lost. The very lightweight three-wheeler was proving hopeless over the almost non-existent Chinese roads, so Pons opted to turn around and loaded his toy car onto a train which took him up to Nankow, which was seemingly absolutely fine for him to do, which contradicts something that comes later. One week into the race, and the convoy of four had only managed 200 miles, the competitors constantly needing to get out with all their rations and provisions so the cars could be pulled across small, ancient and fragile bridges by mules. Sometimes the gaps were simply too tight, and chunks of rocks and boulders had to be physically broken up with pickaxes to create a path. It wasn't until they crossed the border into Mongolia where the cars could actually be driven for extended periods. It was somewhere in the Gobi Desert where the plucky ponds retired the control from the race. The front four were fed up of constantly needing to turn around and look for him as he had fallen so far behind. So, in a gentleman's agreement, they decided to abandon him in the desert. I had great confidence in the outcome of the Peking to Paris raid. Alas, fatality fell upon me. I had to give up in circumstances which proved to me that if friendship of men is a blessing of the gods, it is because it is extremely rare, and the adage, it is necessary to help one another, it is the law of nature, is not often put into practice. This was the opening of a letter August Pons wrote detailing his ordeals in the race. I have left a link to this letter in the description because it is well worth a read. The realisation that his machine was inadequate, his struggles with resources, the heartbreaking betrayal of his friends, and the story of survival with the aid of Mongolian tribespeople, all present. Though I must say, considering they undoubtedly saved his life, you think he would have spoken nicer of the locals. I admit it is a little humiliating to see that we received help and assistance from these savage tribes. Alright Pons, no wonder the others left you in the desert. Remember earlier I said Borghese's journey to China would prove beneficial later? Well later is now. The prince had the forethought to arrange locals on camels go into the desert and lay supplies for him. Fuel, tyres, other provisions and the like. Contrast this with Goddard. He was the one who sold all of his spare everythings and had to steal money for fuel from the Dutch embassy. Unsurprisingly, he didn't nearly have enough fuel for the whole 10,000 miles and eventually ran his spiker down to empty in the Gobi. While Mongolian tribesmen were willing to help out Pons, they were not willing to offer the same kindness to the fraudster. The Dertions of Cormier and Collion had agreed to send fuel back to Goddard once they'd reached the town of Oud, or Ude, 
roughly 120 miles away. Now we reach the second occasion where one of the competitors was in mortal peril. While awaiting for fuel, both Godard and his riding journalist, Dutali, kept themselves alive by drinking water from the car's radiator, and when Dutali began suffering from malaria and dysentery, Godard sportingly abandoned him in the desert. Well, that's not quite true, as Godard is our unlikely hero in this subplot. As we've seen before, he's a master of persuasion, and after setting off into the Gobi by his lonesome, he returned. Dutali must have thought he was delirious looking up, seeing Godard, not only with Mongolians on horseback carrying fuel, but also camels to help tow the spiker. Godard was back in the race. Roughly 800 miles across the Gobi, the well-prepared Borghese played his hand. While the plan was the following of telegram wires, the Italian set off on his own custom route. The Itala was the most powerful of the machines in the race, giving it good speed through the wilderness. But this isn't as clear as an advantage as you'd think. There wasn't much efficiency in engine design back then, so if you wanted more power, you had to make your engine bigger, and bigger the engine, the heavier the car would become, and Borghese got bogged down. Literally bogged down. When travelling through some marshlands, the Italia got stuck in a quagmire and began to sink. Like Pons and Goddard, when stranded, it was the Mongolians to the rescue again. If this ever gets turned into a film, which it should, you might roll your eyes at this part because you've already seen it twice before. There's just no jeopardy when you've got Mongolian horsemen riding around. With four startled oxen pulling when the engine was fired up, the Itala was freed and Borghese was back in the race. With further oxen assistance when crossing the Iro River, the prince continued onto the Russian border, where they learnt that their detour had worked. Despite getting stuck, they had a lead of a whole day. In Russia, the plan for all teams was to follow the railway tracks of the Trans-Siberian Railway, the easiest route to follow to the west. The dead Yons reportedly crossed Russia without any major incidents, while Goddard's spiker was falling apart. In the rear axle, a hole had formed, resulting in high oil loss, so the ingenious Goddard managed to bug it with some raw bacon. I don't know how much heat would have been generated from the axle, but after a while, I imagine his car must have smelt amazing. One issue solved, but no amount of salt cured meat could help him when his magneto failed. Again, no spares, and this is where I'm left a little confused. Right at the start of the race, Pons was allowed to load his not so reliant three wheeler aboard a train, whereas Goddard had to ship his spiker to a technical school in Siberia for repairs, but had to return to the same place he broke down, as the rules didn't allow any of the competitors to compete any part of the race by rail or ship. These events took place over a hundred years ago, so perhaps it's not too surprising that there are some inconsistencies in what was reported, but in any case, it is likely that Goddard didn't follow in these instructions anyway. His riding journalist, Dutelli, had been transferred over to the two dead Yons, as Goddard was now so far behind, there was no point on reporting on his progress anymore. With no one to keep tabs on him, do you believe the man who stole from the Dutch embassy was going to play fairly? Oh yeah, I should mention that it was around this time that Goddard, in his absence, was being tried in Paris for that indiscretion. As driving duties were split amongst the main pilot and crew, Mr. Spiker realised he couldn't just leave Goddard to continue on his Todd, so he sent someone to join him. Bruno Stefan, office boy, two first names, couldn't drive. Sorry, why did you send him? Goddard was in for one hell of a driving stint, which at one point included driving non-stop for 29 hours. Le Mans, eat your heart out. The two eventually rejoined the dead Yons in Kazan, after Goddard had covered the same distance in two weeks that the others had in a month. You're a bad man, but I have to admit, that's pretty metal. Borghese had his own fair share of drama travelling through Russia. While he wanted to follow the same route as the railway, the Italian found himself stuck when he reached Lake Baikal in southern Siberia, as the roads and bridges were not suitable for his Itala. So, onto the Trans-Siberian Railway itself. And when there's something on the railway that shouldn't be there, there are two possible outcomes. Either nothing happens, or... Well, I can sure you can guess for yourselves. A train came along, so car and crew were rushed off the tracks, and they gave the inadequate roads and bridges a go. One of these inadequate bridges proved to be inadequate, and proceeded to collapse under the weight of the Itala, almost crushing the prince. Sounds like they were safer on the tracks. Oh wait, they did go back onto the track, with some help from railway workers. 
and almost got hit by another train. Why has this never been turned into a film? Set piece after set piece. By the time Borghese had reached Moscow, it was estimated that he had a lead of 18 days. And because these early pilots were a touch eccentric, instead of continuing on his merry way to the finish, the prince abruptly turned north up to St. Petersburg. Why on earth would he do this? Well, apparently there was a party he wanted to attend. Yep, a 700 km detour so he could revel in some Imperial Russian opulence. When was this? 1907? Enjoy it while it lasts, I suppose. Continuing on to Eastern Europe, through Germany, into Belgium, and finally across into France, he continued to make celebratory stops and incredibly built his lead further. 60 days after the convoy fearfully set off in front of the suspicious Chinese officials, after crossing the Gobi, abandoning ponds, heading off on his own custom route, almost losing the Italia in the Mongolian swamp, a hat-trick of film-worthy set pieces involving two trains and a collapsing bridge, and partying like a fresher, Prince Scipione Borghese arrived in Paris having covered 10,000 miles to win the Peking Paris race of 1907. For this, he won a bottle of champagne. Yep, that was the prize. The tangible prize anyway. But this whole thing was about could it be done, and the Italians showed that it could. Such pride they took in this victory, their first major win on the European motorsport stage. The blood red, crimson red, scarlet red, or as it's more famously known as, the Rosso Corsa livery of the Italia was officially adopted as the racing colour of Italy in tribute. Ask a child to draw a car and certainly, he will draw it red. A famous quote by Enzo Ferrari. In, referen in reference to the iconic red Ferraris, that Itella has quite the legacy. The De Dion's finished the race some 20 days after, meaning the Count De Dion had delivered on his words from the start, and then some. Tandem finishes, good work. Meanwhile, Goddard was arrested for borrowing from the Dutch consulate in Peking. Yeah, I guess lying, stealing, and potentially cheating can only get you so far. And that's today's lesson, kids. Again, because this race was over 100 years ago, we have some conflicting information. In this book I have, Motor Racing Strangest Races, my guy Jeff Tibbles says that Goddard was arrested under false claims, under the orders of Le Martin, so he would be beaten by the French De Dion's. But in this online article about Goddard, which I've linked in the description, refutes this. Some have speculated that the charges against Goddard were whipped up to prevent him from embarrassing the De Dion's on their home soil, by finishing ahead of them. This theory, however, ignores that Freeling and the spike of finished second behind the Itala that competed the race weeks prior. So truth be told, I have no idea who finished second, third or fourth, because these sources can't come to a consensus. I do, however, like the detail that Goddard, in one final act of defiance, supposedly pulled a trump and tried to take control of the spiker just outside Paris, so he could be the one to finish the drive. As motor racing is a very flamboyant advertising project, sales for Italas and De Dion's soared, and the actual cars that traversed halfway around the world were quite the attraction. After an exhibition at the Olympia Motor Show in London the following year, there was even enough demand to show the cars off in America, where our story suffers something of a bad ending. The Itala, winner of the 10,000 mile race, whose legacy is the blood that still flows through motor racing's veins, rolled into the water at Genoa Docks as it was being transported to New York. The car was salvaged, but said to have been badly damaged. Today it resides in the National Automobile Museum in Turin, but is quite clearly not red and in a very pristine condition. Makes me think about Trigger's broom paradox, where so many parts have been lost and replaced. Is it really the same car anymore? <laughs>